All right, well, hello everyone, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion about objects and classes. And we'll also learn about some new tools like constructors, friends, and how to use objects in arrays. If you haven't already done so, please make sure that you have reviewed our previous video introducing objects and classes. This video picks up where our previous video left off. So here's our goals for today's video. First, we'll review a little bit of what we learned about classes, and we'll introduce this idea of abstract data types. We'll learn what an abstract data type is and how classes allow us to create these things. Then we'll learn about how we can use functions called constructors in order to initialize objects of a class. We'll learn about another kind of function called a friend function, which is used to enable us to access private data in our classes. And finally, we'll learn how we can use arrays of objects and things to watch out for. Let's briefly review what we've learned so far about classes before we continue on. In our previous video, we introduced classes and we learned that they are an improved version of a struct. The way we declare a class is very similar to a struct. We use the keyword class, we give our class a name with a capital letter, and we enclose the contents of our class in curly braces. But notice when we declare a class, we also have these private and public designations. We can make any data that's private accessible only by members of our rectangle class, in this case. On the other hand, anything designated as public will be available to any function or any other part of our program. The public and private designations allow us to selectively show or hide data depending on our needs. In our previous video, we also learned some important rules to follow when working with classes. If you happen to be writing a program that uses a class and your entire program is in a single CPP file, then you would want to make sure you include your class declaration at the beginning of your program. If you instead choose to use multiple files to, to write your class program, then you'd want to follow the procedure demonstrated in our previous video, where you make header files and implementation files along with your main function. Now remember that variables are generally made to be private because most of the time, we want to control who has access to our data. Once we've declared our class, we can use our class to create objects. Remember, objects are instances of a class, similar to how houses can be built from a blueprint. To declare an object of a class, we just take our class's name, and then we give the name of an object that we want to create. So this code rectangle box would allow us to create an object named box, which is of the rectangle class. Another thing to remember is that we need to use the dot operator in order to call functions associated with our class. For example, if I want to call the set width function, I use box dot set width in order to call the set width function on my box object. Remember that we cannot simply say box dot width equals some value. We have to use our set and get functions in order to access data that is private to our class. We also learned about how we need to do a few special things 
when defining member functions of our class. If you look back at our class declaration, you can see that we had declared a number of public member functions for that rectangle class. But these are just declarations. We still need to write the definition somewhere so that these functions know what to do when they are called. If we're writing our class program in a single file, then the function definitions would be listed after our main function ends. Remember, if we're using separate files to prepare our class program, our function definitions would instead go in the implementation file. In either case, regardless of where we put our member function definitions, we need to make sure that we include these important syntax rules. Remember that the function declaration goes inside the class declaration at the beginning of our program. However, the function definitions need to be in a separate location. You'll notice next to each function definition, we have this special code rectangle and the scope resolution operator. You'll remember, this code is needed to designate each function as a member of the rectangle class. And once you have added that scope resolution operator, you would add the code inside your function definition to define it as usual. Remember that member functions do have access to the class's private variables, but other functions which are not members of the class cannot directly access our private variables. So if you'd like further review on these points about classes, definitely check out our previous video for a demo and more detailed explanation. Finally, in our previous video, we demonstrated how to use multiple files when writing programs with classes. It certainly is possible to write a program that uses classes and fit everything into a single CPP file. However, often we write programs that contain many classes and many functions. And instead of trying to fit everything in one CPP file, we instead choose to use multiple files with classes. So very commonly, we choose to spread our class's code across three files. You'll remember in the previous video, we demonstrated the built-in tools that make it easy to create these files. The first file we would need to create is the header file, also known as the interface file. This is the file that contains the class declaration. The next file that we create is called the implementation file. Remember that the implementation file is where we put the definitions for all the member functions for that class. We also need to include our header file using an include statement to reference that class declaration. Finally, the last file we would need when working with classes is the application file. This is where we put our main function. And just like with the implementation file, we need to include classname.h in order to reference our class declaration. So before we move on to our new material, let's briefly review what we've learned so far about classes. Let's do so by playing a game called Will It Compile? So we'll go ahead and suppose that we have the rectangle class and the main function shown on the left here. And we are also told we may assume that all our functions are defined properly 
So the definitions for these set width, set length functions, these have all been properly defined. So this question asks us to review each line shown on the left and indicate whether it will compile. If it will compile, we'll just say yes. If the line will not compile, we'll explain why not. Let's go through this line by line and review what we know about classes. Let's look at our first lines, line one and line two. Will these compile? Correct answer here is no. Lines one and two will not compile. Why not? Do you remember? Thing to remember here is that width and length are private variables. So we cannot directly change width and length just by writing code in main. Also, we need to specify whose length and width we want to change. Is it length and width for our box object that we just declared? Or is it someone else's length and width? So here, we would need to use some dot operator and other functions. We would basically need to specify whose length we want to change. Let's consider our next lines three and four. Will these lines compile? You'll notice that we did make an improvement. We are correctly using the dot operator in order to try to access the width and length of our box object. But width and length are private variables. Will our main function be able to access width and length directly? If you're thinking no, you would be correct. Once again, width and length are private. So since width and length are private variables, we can't directly access them using the dot operator. Only the member functions of rectangle can access width and length. Let's now consider lines five and six. We're trying to do better, and so here we're actually calling the function set length and set width. So those functions will be able to access width and length. However, do you notice anything wrong with these functions? These lines also won't compile, and the reason why is we need to use the dot operator. We need to use the dot operator to specify which object to call get length and set length on. Okay, so that brings us to line seven and eight. Will these compile? Correct answer here is no. These lines will not compile because the dot operator is not being used correctly here. So remember, we can't use the class name with the dot operator. We need to use the name of the object we want to access or call the function on. So finally, that brings us to lines nine and 10. Will these compile? 
correct answer is yes. Finally, we have written the correct code in order to set the length and width of our box object to be rect width and rect length in our main function. So we needed to use the dot operator to tell our main function which object to call set length and set width on. And because length and width are private variables, the only way that we can access our private variables is by using set width and set length, which are members of the rectangle class. So please make sure you understand this example well before we move on. It's really important to understand the fundamentals of objects and classes, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions on this. Let's now continue on to our next topic. And let's first start with a CodySense question. Here we have a class called Point, and you can see that this Point class is intended to store an X value and Y value, kind of like an XY point in the coordinate plane. So we have our class, we're told we can assume our functions are fully defined properly. And our question's asking, what is this cout statement going to output? What do you think? Take a moment and think about it. All right, what do you think? So it turns out that the result for this output depends a little bit on your own IDE and compiler, because it turns out that this cout statement will return uninitialized data. Notice we have just declared our point PT so if we declare our point PT, notice point PT is going to have some memory allocated for X value and some memory allocated for Y value. But these are currently uninitialized. We have not yet given X value or Y value a value. And in our next line of code, with that cout statement, we're immediately attempting to return data that has not been initialized. So in this case, you'll most likely see choice C, some random value from memory. But depending on your IDE and your compiler, you could potentially see zero, or you might get a compiler error. The reason for this is because the memory is uninitialized. So we just saw an example of how our PT object that we declared was uninitialized. So we need to initialize our objects. And right now, the only way we know how to do that is by writing all those set and get functions. And that could be kind of a pain. We want to be the good kind of lazy. So it turns out there's another tool that helps us initialize objects more easily tool is called a constructor. So what exactly is a constructor? A constructor is a member function of a class, and just as its name suggests, it can be used to make more objects of that class. Basically, it constructs more objects of your class, and it helps Depending on what you specify, you can include instructions to initialize those objects with given values or other instructions as required. There's a few very important rules for constructors. Remember, constructor is just a function 
that initializes our objects. But it does have special rules. So the first rule is that constructors are automatically called when an object of that class is declared. So unlike other functions where we have to write special code to call that function, constructors are automatically called whenever we try to declare an object. Another important rule is that the name of our constructor, like the name of that function, it must be the same name as the class's name. So if my class is named rectangle, my rectangle constructor must also be called rectangle. Another important thing to note is that constructors do not have a return type. All they do is they initialize our objects. Constructors are usually made public, so they're public member functions most of the time. And very often we use overloading to declare different versions of a constructor. Remember, overloading allows us to have multiple functions with the same name. So let's take a closer look at these rules and try writing some constructors. So how do we use constructors? Remember, it might sound fancy, but constructors are just member functions. We already know how to write functions, so constructors are just a slightly special kind of member function. And remember, all constructors do is initialize our member variables to some desired value. So basically, we declare and define constructors in a very similar way to the other member functions in our class. Here's how we do it. The first step is we declare the constructor in our class. So the constructor is usually a public member function. For example, if we had our rectangle class, We would put it under the public functions. And remember, the name of the class is always the name of our constructor. So notice here, I could, within my class declaration, I could include some public declarations for a couple of rectangle constructors. So that would be our first step. We first have to declare that constructor as a member function of that class. In the next step, we define our constructor. So that means we need to go to our implementation file or our function definitions, and we have to write the code that that constructor is supposed to do. Remember, it still needs a scope resolution operator because it's a member of the rectangle class. So for example here, if I wanted, I could write this rectangle constructor definition in order to update my width and length variables to be the values in the argument. So look how easy it is to write the definition for a constructor. Constructors primarily initialize our member variables, so all we needed to write in order for this function to work is we just needed to initialize our member variables 
to the desired values. In this case, I'm initializing the private variables width and length to be the values that I had specified in the argument. Finally, our last step is to call the constructor. And to do that, all we need to do is act as if we are declaring that object. So for example, to call the constructor I just wrote, I would write the code rectangle my box to three. And notice we would recognize that our constructor call had two arguments, so this would call the rectangle constructor with the two arguments. And this would basically allow us to initialize my box with, in this case, we would have width equals two and length equals three, because we would be calling our constructor. So let's take a closer look at these steps now that we've looked at the high level process. Remember, all we're doing here is writing functions that initialize our objects. That's all a constructor is. So in this case, let's go ahead and declare, define, and call some constructors for our rectangle class, just like we described. And one other thing to be aware of for the purpose of this course is remember that our assignments will require that you include preconditions and postconditions for all function definitions. What this means is you should also include preconditions and postconditions for your constructors. Because once again, those are also functions. So let's look at how we would declare a constructor. So remember, when you declare a constructor, you need to make sure you follow the rules that we described. So in this example, we have our rectangle class, and we've declared a constructor named rectangle with double initial width, double initial length as the arguments. So notice that the constructor must have the same name as the class. Here we named it rectangle. Also notice that we do not have any return type. We're not declaring like int rectangle or void rectangle, it is just rectangle. Here we've also included an example of what a precondition and postcondition would look like for a constructor. Here our required initial settings are that the initial width and initial length values must be initialized to some positive double. These are going to give us our initial width and initial length when we initialize. You see in our post condition, we're initializing our private variable width to be whatever value initial width is. And we initialize our private variable length to be the value of initial length passed in the argument. So notice, if we call this constructor, This constructor will help us initialize a rectangle object to have width 
initial width and length initial length. Otherwise, if we were not using that constructor, we would have to go back later and write more code in order to initialize our object. So this constructor allows us to, with one line of code, to declare and initialize that rectangle object with initial values. So next we have to define our constructors. Remember, the definition is where we tell our function what code it needs to execute when called. But remember that the definition for your constructor will go in the same place as the definitions for other member functions. Notice in this case, our constructor still requires the scope resolution operator. And that's because we need to make sure that we designate the rectangle constructor as a member of the rectangle class. Otherwise, you'll notice the function definition is very simple. Here, based on our precondition and postcondition comments, you can see that we are initializing our private variables width and length. We're initializing these private variables width and length to be the values specified in the argument. So whatever values are passed in with our function call, those become our initial width and initial length in our rectangle object. Finally, the last thing to do when we're ready to call our constructor is to actually call the constructor. But remember, constructors are not called like a normal member function. So we cannot use the dot operator box one dot rectangle two three. That won't work. Remember, when calling a constructor, if you want to actually call that constructor, you have to declare a new object. So notice what's happening here. Notice the arguments specified with the object name. If I call this constructor box one and plug in two and three, that's going to go back to my function definition and it's going to plug in initial width is two, initial length is three, and it's going to initialize width and length of box one to be two and three. So notice how useful constructors can be. It's really important to make sure that you can declare and initialize objects easily, and constructors enable us to do this. So if you're ever asked to write some constructors on an assignment or on an exam, you should immediately be happy, because you should see that constructors are actually very nice functions to write, and they follow very specific rules. The key thing is remembering these important differences between constructors and other member functions. So we also mentioned that we sometimes choose to overload constructors. And this is because sometimes we want to 
declare and create objects with different sets of parameter values. For example, here, I can overload the rectangle constructor and give it two versions. Notice this first version, it will declare and initialize an rectangle object. And remember, it will declare and initialize that object to have width is initial width. And length equals initial length. But maybe we don't necessarily know what our initial width and length is always going to be. So notice we could have this second version. We'll learn later, this is called the default constructor. And this constructor will automatically trigger if no arguments are given when an object is declared. So depending on the situation, if we know what width and length we want our rectangle to have, then we could use our first version of the constructor. But if we're not sure yet, or we do not provide arguments for initial width and initial length, then we can instead call the second version of our constructor. Remember that the compiler determines which constructor to use based on the number of arguments and the type of those arguments. So the compiler will automatically figure out which version of rectangle to call based on the arguments that you provide it, or based on the fact that no arguments were provided. So let's talk a little bit more about this default constructor. We just introduced the idea that we might write a constructor that takes no arguments. And the default constructor, by definition, is a constructor which does not take any arguments when called. You see it has empty parentheses. And so you might be thinking, well, when would we use that? Well, what about all those times when you want to make a rectangle, but you don't specify any arguments to plug into a constructor? Or maybe you are writing some classes and code for a coworker, and your coworker isn't sure what values to use, so you provide some initial values as a starting point. So we call the default constructor the default constructor because if no input arguments are given with the constructor when declared, then it is the default version that will be called. So since no arguments are provided when we call rectangle box, this will use the default constructor automatically. So if we were writing our rectangle class, we would declare a default constructor using the code shown here. You'll notice that just like with other constructors, we use the name of our class, but we use empty parentheses to indicate that the default constructor takes no arguments. In terms of preconditions and postconditions, you see the default constructor basically doesn't have any preconditions because it takes no arguments. In this case, for the postcondition, we decided to have our default constructor initialize width and length to zero. A default constructor does not necessarily have to initialize things to zero. At the end of the day, 
you want to initialize your objects to some known default value so that you know that they have not yet been initialized to anything special. Often we choose the number zero, but it could be some other value. You may also want to choose something like negative one to make it obvious that the width and length were not intentionally set to that value. So remember, default constructor does not necessarily have to set things to zero. You could set them to any initial value that you choose. So here's an important point about default constructors. If we do not define our default constructor, then C++ by definition is just going to create a function with an empty definition. So it'll basically do nothing. Here's an important rule to follow. In this course, and in probably most of the courses you will take in programming, you should always declare and define your default constructor. This is a very good practice. There may be some rare exceptions later where you do not want to necessarily declare and define the default constructor. But for our purposes, this ensures that any object we create using our class, if we do not provide initial arguments, we will at least initialize it to something. So let's look at how we would define the default constructor. In our case, we chose to have our default constructor initialize width and length to zero. So it doesn't necessarily have to be zero. So the default constructor does not always have to initialize stuff to zero, but we need to needs to be some initial value. And remember, our general rule, at least for this class, is you should always declare and define your default constructor. Another question that's commonly asked is what should the default constructor do? What variables should it change? The general rule of thumb is that most of the time, your default constructor should initialize all private variables to some initial value, often zero. So the variables it should change are the private variables of the class. And remember, our goal is to initialize all those private variables to some initial value. We might change it later, but at least we don't have an uninitialized object floating around and potentially creating errors. Finally, suppose we are ready to call the default constructor. Remember, if no arguments are provided when we declare an object, we will automatically use the default constructor. So if we use rectangle box one, this would use the default constructor. If we instead had rectangle box two, so notice the difference. If we do provide arguments with our object's declaration, then we would instead use another constructor if available. The default constructor is only used if no arguments are given with that object's declaration. So remember, you can have multiple 
overloaded versions of each constructor, but you can only have one default constructor. Remember, each overloaded version of a constructor needs a different number and type of arguments. in order for the overloading to work. Because otherwise a compiler won't recognize the different versions. So let's go ahead and do a quick practice question before we move on. See if you can identify the false statement about default constructors. Take a moment and see if you can identify the false statement. Let's first go through and identify the true statements. Choice B is definitely true. A default constructor takes no arguments. Remember the default constructor is the one that's called when no arguments are provided with the declaration. Choice C is also true. You'll remember from our slides a moment ago that if you do not give a definition for your default constructor, C++ will create a default constructor, but it'll do nothing. We also mentioned that it is indeed a good practice to always include a default constructor in your programs and make sure you remember to fully define it. Make sure your default constructor knows how you should initialize those constructors or how you should initialize the objects that you're trying to create. So therefore choice A is the false statement. Notice C++ will not automatically set all private variables to zero. You have to tell your default constructor to do this if that is indeed what you want. Let's look at one more short example of some constructors being used. Here you can see we've created a bank account class, and there's actually three different constructors that are declared. So notice the one that takes no arguments. This is our default constructor. And this constructor is being set up such that it initializes the bank account to have zero balance and zero percent interest rate. But suppose we do have some initial balance and initial interest rate to put in our account. The second constructor, this one, would initialize an account to have the number of dollars and the rate specified in the arguments. And finally, this top example would initialize the account and this one would have the dollars cents and rate all provided in the argument. So depending on what you're trying to do in your programs, you would want to declare different versions of your constructor to make life easier. Maybe sometimes you only need a default constructor, but other times it's convenient to have multiple constructors depending on what data you have and, and how you want to initialize your objects. Here's a couple more points about having multiple constructors. So remember that any of these bank account constructors 
are designed to assign values to the bank account member variables. But then notice the compiler checks the number of arguments and determines which version to call. So notice that the default constructor will automatically set balance and interest rate to zero, but the other constructors will actually update the private variables based on what was given in the argument. Let's do a quick practice question before we move on. Let's, let's try writing a default constructor for the rectangle class. Once again, we want to write this default constructor, which will initialize the rectangle object such that its width and length are both zero. We would write the declaration inside our public members of the class. So in this case, the declaration could be something like this with our precondition and postcondition. So remember, default constructors don't really have preconditions because they're not taking any values as their argument. Next, if we want to do the definition, Remember that goes in the implementation file. And in this case for rectangle, we would, we would need to include that scope resolution operator. And what would the default constructor do? Remember, all it needs to do is initialize our width to zero and initialize our length to zero. Otherwise, it's just like any other function we would write. Of course, remember to include the scope resolution operator. And there you have it. So constructors are really handy, and they're actually pretty easy to code up. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions on this, and definitely make sure you understand how to write constructors. You're going to need to do this on our future assignments, and very likely you may have some quiz or exam questions about them as well. Okay, so all this constructor stuff is fine and dandy, but why do we care about this? And where do we go from here? Let's now talk about a couple other important points that are really vital to classes. The first one is this idea of creating what's called abstract data types. Classes actually allow us to create these abstract data types by allowing us to hide data behind some public interface. Well, why would we want to do that? Remember, in the real world, programs may be written by teams of people. Abstract data types helps us a lot because it makes it a lot easier to divide sections of programs for people to work on. Some people can write the data types while at the same time, other people can actually write the code that uses those data types. So one big advantage of using classes is that it allows us to basically separate the implementation or the functions and code behind our classes and have a separate public interface, which the rest of our programs outside the class are able to see. We'll see that having these abstract data types also makes programs 
easier to debug and modify. So what exactly is an abstract data type? We say that a data type is an abstract data type if programmers using it do not have access to the details of how the values and operations are implemented. And so basically what happens here is that the private variables within a class, these are hidden away. Also, the function definitions are hidden. But if I were to give this rectangle class to a coworker or a classmate, the coworker or classmate would be able to use the public members of the class. So the public members and functions Those are usable to other code outside the class. So we can let all our coworkers mess around with the public parts of our class. And meanwhile, we keep our critical data and other important stuff hidden away so that people don't mess with it. So let's return to that car analogy. We mentioned the car analogy a little bit earlier when we introduced classes and data hiding. Suppose your grandmother is driving a car. Your grandmother probably does not really need to know how the engine works. You'll notice that a car definitely has some sort of public interface. All cars have pedals, steering wheels, turn signals, and other features which the user operates. And if I were to go rent a car, I would expect that even my rental car would still have the same components as my grandma's car or a car that I might own. So every car has this public interface that the user can directly operate but the rest of the car's operations are hidden. So notice that things like the engine of the car, the fuel pump, the brakes, the brake fluid, the motor oil, all that stuff is hidden away. And the user generally does not need to access that stuff. And another important point is we can change this hidden stuff, but the public interface will not change. So even if I go in and upgrade the engine or replace the oil or change the brakes on someone's car, that, that individual, like your grandmother, would still be able to drive the car and it would not change the public interface. So the key thing here is that changes to hidden data and functions do not affect the public interface. So if we return to that point we made earlier about making code that's easier to change and maintain, this is definitely allowing us to improve the maintainability of our code and make our code easier to write, especially with a team. So we can all agree on what the public interface needs to look like and then everybody on the team can go in and write their own separate classes and objects for various parts, but everyone else is going to know how that public interface will look, and that public interface is not going to change. So that's abstract data types in a nutshell. Essentially, we are using the public and private designation in a class in order to selectively share or hide data and functions. We can use this to create a public interface that anyone can access and keep certain data and functions hidden away and only used under certain conditions.
All right, so we have just a few more topics to cover about classes. Let's try a Cody Sense question first. Suppose I have this class named Day of Year. And you can see that we have some constructors in there. And we have some functions that will allow us to set month and day, which are our private variables. And so our question here is asking, will the equal function be able to compare two day of year objects? Notice this equal function takes day of year objects as its arguments Notice the equal function is supposed to return true if the day of your objects have the same private variables. So question is, will this equal function be able to successfully compare these two objects. What do you think? So here's a question to think about. Are month and day public or private? And will the equal function have permission to access any private variables? Yeah, so notice in this case, month and day are private variables. That means only members of day of year can access. Is the equal function a member of the day of year class? No, it's not. So because equal is not a member, it can't access the private variables. So correct answer here is no. The equal function does not have access to the private variables, so it's impossible for the equal function to be able to compare the two objects. So therefore, just to reiterate, month and day are private variables. In order to access those private variables directly, we either need to use the get and set member functions, or we instead can do one other potential loophole. If we have a non-member function that must have access to a class's private variables, we can use what's called a friend function. So in some cases, sometimes we don't want to make a function a member of a class, but we do want to allow other functions to access our private data. If we want to give a non-member function access to a class's private data, we can make that function a friend of a class. So here's an example. If we made that equal function friends with the day of year class, then equal would now be able to access the private variables month and day. So it's actually fairly straightforward to make a function a friend of a class. Notice that we needed to include the equal function as a member function of day of year, and then we added the keyword friend. So here's, a, here's what you need to remember about friend functions. First, remember friend functions are not member functions. It's kind of like how 
Friends may not be your blood relatives or family members, but they can still be very close people who you care about. Friend functions can access private members of a class. So basically, it's like a non-family member being able to have access to private data. Because friend functions have access to private data, they can directly read or change that data. Another thing to note about friend functions is they do not need the scope resolution operator when being declared and defined. They're defined and called in the same way as ordinary functions. Remember, friend functions are not members of a class, so they do not need to have that scope resolution operator indicating membership. So when would we actually use friend functions? It turns out friend functions are rarely used. The best practice is that if you have a non-member function and it must have access to your class, then make it a friend function. There's some rare situations where you must use friends when we do overloading, but this is a very rare, uncommon thing. So typically, friend functions are more of a programming style choice for efficiency rather than absolute requirement. Therefore, for this course, I'm not going to cover friend syntax on exams, but you should know about it in case you need to use it in more advanced programming courses. So again, these slides are provided just for your information here. I'm not going to ask you about friend syntax on exams in this course, but in case you need them in the future, note that friend function declarations can be made in several ways. For example, if I want to put the friend function as a member of our class, we can just declare it in our class declaration. Or we can also declare our friend function to be the friend of some other class. And that would also work. So you can have both standalone functions and be friends with functions who are members of some other class. Also, it turns out you can make classes friends with other classes. So if you want a whole class to be able to access another class's private data, then you can actually do that as well. Once again, I'm not going to require that you know this syntax for this course, but it may become important in more advanced courses that you might take. All right, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions on what we've covered so far. Objects in classes can be a little intimidating at first, so definitely make sure you give yourself that time to practice them and get comfortable, and reach out for help if you need. Let's go ahead and continue on with our last topic, which is arrays in classes. We already introduced how we would use the dot operator to access arrays or manipulate arrays of a struct. And it turns out that the rules for arrays and classes are very similar. Here's the rules to remember. First, we can make arrays using structs and objects. And remember that structs and objects can also contain an array as a member variable. It's important to remember how to access values in an array of objects or structs. Remember, you can use the dot operator to access indexed items, and you also need to use square brackets in order to identify which variables you want to access. One other thing to remember is to pay attention to public and private variables. Remember, 
if you are trying to access data, from outside the class, so not using a member function. Remember that private variables can only be accessed using a member function. So you might need to use the get or the set functions in order to update data if you're trying to access data outside of that class. Let's look at a few examples to practice this. So let's consider this first question. We have that day of year class again. And suppose I declared an array in the main function. So I'm outside of the class. I am not in a member function. That means I can't access the private variables directly. So if I wanted to set birthdays element 0 to October 31st within this array of 10 day of year objects, one way I could do this is I could say birthdays element 0 dot set month 10, birthdays element 0 dot set day 31st. This would update birthdays element 0 to hold the date, October 31st. Question is, could I also use the dot operator to do the same thing? What do you think? The answer here is no. Remember, month and day are private. So they can only be accessed using a member function. So once again, the answer here, I must use the set function since month and day are private and they would not be accessible by the main function because the main function is not a member of the day of year class. Let's try another question. Suppose we have that same array, birthdays, which contains 10 day of year objects. And here, notice I'm in the main function still, so I am not in a member function. How would I output the month of birthdays element 9 to the screen? Could I say see out? birthdays element 9 dot month or could I do this? Which one of these would be correct? Turns out this first one won't work. Remember, month is a private variable. The second option will work because get month has access to the private variable month. So notice we have to use the dot operator and we have to call a getter function if we're trying to access private data outside of the day of year class. 
So once again, we'd have to use birthdays element 9 dot get month in order to output the month to the screen. All right, let's try one more. Suppose I do have a member function that I'm writing code for. And suppose I declared birthdays element 10 inside a member function. Remember, if I'm inside a member function, I do have access to private variables. So how would I set month and day of birthdays element 3 to be February 28th? In this case, since I do have access to private variables, I can go directly like this. I could still choose to use the set functions if I wanted. Sometimes you might prefer doing that if the set functions perform any sort of valid value checking. But in this case, I can use the dot operator since I do have access to private variables. So once again, the dot operator will work if I'm writing code inside a member function, because if I'm in a member function, then I do have access to my private variables. All right, just for fun, let's do one last one. Suppose I am in a member function and I have an array of day of year elements. So I've got 10 day of year elements in the array named birthdays. How would I initialize all elements to January 31st? Well, in this case, the easiest way to do so is using a for loop. Remember what I can do here is I can say birthdays element i dot month equals one birthdays element i dot day equals thirty one close my braces and notice this would go through element 0 through element 9 of birthdays and initialize each day and month to be January 31st. Because I'm in a member function, I can access the private variables. So once again, there is how your code would look. Remember, if I was not in a member function, I would need to use get month and get day or set month and set day in order to access those private variables. Inside a member function, I can just use the dot operator. All right, so let's go ahead and wrap up here for today. You should now be more comfortable declaring and using classes, and you should now be able to see how classes can be used to create abstract data types. We also covered how to use constructors in order to initialize objects. We also learned about the importance of a default constructor and how it's a good practice to always declare and define your default constructor in order to initialize your objects to some known value. Finally, we learned about how friend functions can help us access private data and give access to non-member functions. And we reviewed how to use objects with arrays and functions. Make sure you pay attention to whether you're trying to access private data from a member function or from outside. Remember, outside of the member functions, you have to use the get and set functions in order to access a class's private data. So feel free to reach out if you have any other questions on objects and classes. In our next video, we're going to take a closer look at more capabilities that classes allow us to do. One of these is using overloaded operators. So we'll talk about that in more detail next time.
Thanks everyone for joining the fun and we'll see you in the next video.